The world is facing a collision of major economic forces, so brace yourselves for further uncertainty and an even riskier future. That is one of the main messages from my next guest, former Bank of Canada Governor Stephen Polos. Mr. Polos served as the ninth governor of the Bank of Canada from June 2013 to June 2020. Now, during this time, up until the outbreak of COVID-19, Canada saw steady GDP growth in the low single digits, low unemployment and inflation close to the bank's 2% target. After leaving the Bank of Canada, he was a member of the board of the Bank for International Settlements. Polos is the author of several books, including his most recent title, The Next Age of Uncertainty, How the World Can Adapt to a Riskier Future. So good to have you with us here on Kitco News. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Michelle. All right, Stephen, we have a lot to discuss, but let's dive in with Canada and the current news. And as we know, the Bank of Canada is expected to raise interest rates by 50 basis points this week. There's virtually a unanimous view amongst economists that the bank will move its benchmark lending rate to 1.5% on Wednesday. Now, this would be the second such hike in a row, all to try and tame inflation, which is at a 31-year high. So, Stephen, how many rate hikes do you expect this year? And how do you see this impacting the Canadian economy, particularly the Canadian housing market, which uh, is considered rather frothy at the moment? Right. Well, a very difficult question to answer. I think you know that well, uh, because what we're really trying to do is lean into a strong headwind. The Canadian economy is very hot right now. And uh, having interest rates rise to a certain extent will, will reduce the excess demand in the economy, hopefully just reduce the excess demand in the economy rather than having a, a meaningful uh, dip into sort of slow growth territory. But that remains to be seen. What we don't know is how will the economy react to these interest rates given how balance sheets have evolved during the pandemic. Uh, that's always a big question mark. We don't know how the economy is reacting to higher oil prices, which of course is draining money out of consumers' pockets and not being complemented by much additional investment in the oil sector. So the traditional relationships that we rely on haven't really been operating. Even the Canadian dollar has not risen in, in line with high oil prices as it normally would. And so that also affects how the outlook has changed relative to the normal modeling. All that to say, I, my hope is that the, the interest rate level will end up around neutral, possibly a little above neutral, and that most of the impact is gonna fall onto the housing sector, which of course has, has grown substantially uh, during the pandemic because that's that was because low interest rates. Uh, so there were a bit of a reversal of that phase of the housing, uh, housing rise. Uh, once that's behind us, we'll be in a position to decide if that's enough or if uh, more needs to be done. And we really can't predict that today. All right. But let's focus a little bit more on the Canadian housing market, which is, as I said, considered rather frothy. Do you anticipate a correction there if uh, the Bank of Canada does maintain its rather aggressive rate hike policy? Well, as I said, that would be the main transmission channel in any case. It always is. It's the main transmission channel we try to boost when we cut interest rates. And of course, when interest rates go back to normal, it's bound to slow down. But I would say that underneath that is a really important floor. Uh, immigration levels are extraordinarily high, well over 400,000 new arrivals uh, this year. That is sure to put a significant floor underneath the Canadian housing market. Uh, whether that avoids a correction in some prices in some overheated markets, who can really say? Uh, I mean, you could have a correction in prices in Toronto or Vancouver, for example. Well, in the big picture, that wouldn't be much of a, much of a shock and it wouldn't mean much to the economy because prices have risen substantially over the last two years. It would take a really, really big correction to really disrupt uh, the housing market and I wouldn't be expecting that. All right. Well, you, you recently said that you see a period of stagflation for Canada's yes. economy. Can you expand on that? Yes. A stagflationary scenario is essentially the optimal one uh, for all central banks to pursue when the main stimulus on inflation is coming from the outside, as it is today. It's primarily energy and other commodity prices. 
uh, and a few other odds and ends that are related to supply chain issues. Those things are forcing prices up. And of course, they measure as inflation, but they're only temporarily inflation because they won't continue to go up forever. They'll stop rising at least and maybe reverse. So while we're in that period uh, of rising prices due to those exogenous forces, what we're really concerned about is that that infects the domestic, the natural inflation process, which is still quite well under control. So these two different things happening at the same time. So really what you want is for the economy to slow enough to take the excess demand out so that we no longer have domestic fueled inflation pressures. Uh, you don't want to crush everything in order to offset the inflation coming from oil prices. So the optimal thing is to have a slowdown in the economy while you have inflation rising due to the exogenous parts. Well, we call that stagflation to be simple about it, but it's not like the 1970s style stagflation where it was self-feeding and, uh, and needed to be broken uh, by a major policy shock. So I would distinguish the two periods that way. Uh, institutionally and structurally, we're in a much different place today. But observationally, it will look just like stagflation to people, and so we may as well understand it, prepare for it. Okay, but you're overall optimistic that the Bank of Canada can get inflation under control, which, uh, as we said, is at a 31-year high at the moment. Yeah, most, most of what we're seeing is truly is temporary or even transitory, to use the term that no <laughs> one will use anymore. Uh, but but when, when an economist says something's transitory, they don't mean it's going to go away the next month, which is kind of the way it was interpreted, uh, which is unfortunate. Really, when an economist says transitory, they mean something that's going to go away by itself. Uh, and so there's every reason to think that you know, once, uh, say, oil prices just stick at $120 for sake of argument, that, you know, 12 months from now, that will fall out of the inflation data. And so we're looking at at least three percentage points in today's observed inflation rate that will fall out all by itself. Right. And all we're worried about is the remainder and does it have self-sustaining momentum? And for that, what we need is, you know, a good reminder that central banks are on the job and they're doing that. Uh, both interest rate changes and, by the way, QT, symbolically very important uh, for expectations formation. There are a lot of people that think QE is what is causing inflation pressures globally. Well, therefore, they should be reassured as QT happens. And right. that should take away that important argument uh, about future inflation. So all in all, I think we should be encouraged that people are reacting the way they are to inflation. Uh, especially governments, because after all, governments and highly indebted households, they're the main beneficiaries from inflation historically. And so it's great to see households uh, quite adamant that they don't like inflation and, and of course, uh, political leaders responding. All right. And just to uh, clarify for our viewers, QE quantitative easing, QT quantitative tightening. Well, you mentioned transitory. And of course, Fed Chair Jerome Powell has gotten a a lot of slack for using that term and then having to backpedal. Like you say, it may be a question of semantics of what exactly he meant by transitory. But let's focus on the situation here in the U.S. because the Fed has also been tightening. We have had criticism from former Fed Chair Ben Bernanke saying that Powell was too slow to raise rates. And now the Fed is expected to be more aggressive to raise rates again by 50 basis points at its next meeting and to pursue a much more aggressive path forward. And Fed Chair Powell has said that he will take rates beyond neutral to try and rein in inflation. That is, of course, causing concerns of a recession. Some are saying that a soft landing is still possible. Goldman Sachs issuing a note today that a recession within the next two years is not inevitable. Mm -hmm. So what is your outlook for the U.S. economy? Can that soft landing be reached or can we expect a recession within the next year or so? Yes, I certainly would agree that there's a substantial window available still to avoid a recession and still get the situation uh, normalized. I do think that a great deal of the inflation we're observing is transitory in a technical sense that it will go away over the next, I would say, 12 months, a little longer perhaps, depending on what happens with oil prices uh, due to the Russian conflict in Ukraine. Setting that aside, I mean, I think uh, I think I, I wouldn't want to second guess uh, 
you know, when should interest rates have, have begun to rise and so on. It's very easy to say looking back. Uh, but I would, I would remind people of this, that two years ago, right now, uh, economists were pretty, pretty, uh, pretty agreed on. We were facing the worst recession since the Great Depression. And mentioning the Great Depression in that context really conjures up images uh, of something pretty bad. We did have all the ingredients of, of a depression. We had declining prices. We had actual deflation. And uh, we had lots of debt in the economy. Those interactions are what give you depressions. Uh, so the fact that we're sitting here arguing about whether we have too much or inflation or whatever is a really big accomplishment compared to that counterfactual. We could have been still in the second Great Depression by now. And I think uh, people need to acknowledge that, uh, as I say with, with Star Trek, you never see uh, you never see Picard and Jordy arguing about how many photon torpedoes <laughs> to use. You know, they just load photon torpedoes and they get the job done. And if they used one too many afterwards, they're not like, wow, shucks, I, I should have held back on that one last photon torpedo. Possibly central banks have overdone this, given how successful fiscal policy was during the pandemic. I think that's basically the that was a big unknown at the beginning. And now we know all that. And so uh, now we're in a position to mop things up. And I don't think uh, it really is the kind of emergency uh, that some are making it out. And I agree that we can get interest rates up enough to slow down the excess demand. And in today's modeling of how inflation works, provided expectations have remained pretty anchored, we will come right back down to 2%. It'll take a little while, uh, but but that's okay. Uh, we, as we go along, we don't have to have a recession to get it done. That's my best base case. Now, that's not the same as saying there won't be a recession, of course, because mistakes can happen or other shocks can happen. $120 oil prices can almost cause a recession all by themselves. So we got to be, uh, we're kind of on the edge of that and interest rates are interplaying with that. So the two things happening at the same time, very hard to predict uh, the net outcome of that. Right. I, I like the uh, Star Trek analogy over there. So uh, you do feel quite confident that uh, the Fed reacted as it should have, given the pandemic, given the global crisis. And you're quite confident that the Fed will be able to tackle inflation successfully. Yes, I am. All right. Well, today we have a Fed Chair Jerome Powell meeting with President Biden to discuss just that inflation and the economy. President Biden has pledged that he's going to refrain from meddling on interest rate policies in an op ed that was published in The Wall Street Journal. Biden saying he's going to stand aside and let the Fed do its job, which is what he's supposed to do, uh, given it's supposed to be apolitical, though he did put much of the blame for rising prices on the Fed. Now, the Fed, like the Bank of Canada, is supposed to be a political. In your experience at the Bank of Canada, how common is it for politicians to discuss economic goals with, with a bank, with a central bank? And do you think that this tends to risk the bank's apolitical mandate, or should there be more communication? Hmm. Well, uh in Canada, like in other countries, there is almost a continuous dialogue between the central bank governor and the treasury secretary, or in Canada, the minister of finance. That's a very common collegial uh, kind of relationship, not a, uh, not, a, not a hierarchical one in any way. Uh, independence uh, of the central bank has always been highly respected in my experience uh, in Canada. It's rare to see public discussions, you know, of of you know, what should be done or what shouldn't be done. Of course, the debate happens all the time, and, uh, and that's perfectly legitimate because we are not in a science-based uh, business. It's, it's one where there's an awful lot of unknowns, always. So there's always a margin on which debate uh, is helpful because you learn from it. So um, I, I, like I said a moment ago, I think this is encouraging to see the level of engagement that we're seeing today around inflation because in fact, uh, historically, governments, especially governments with a lot of debt, and you can't really point to one today that doesn't have a lot of debt, have actually been major beneficiaries from inflation because it reduces their debt burden actually very rapidly. 
And so there's always this temptation on the political side to have a little more inflation, you know, that, that's going to make things a little more smooth sailing. And uh, so I'm glad to see the political reaction counter, uh, countering that. That's exactly what we would hope. And of course, the path forward being an independent central bank getting its job done. All right. Well, speaking of reactions to inflation and a dialogue, if you will, I want to get your thoughts on uh, some comments that have been leveled against the Bank of Canada. There's been a lot of criticism as to how the Bank of Canada has handled inflation. One of the loudest critics is Pierre Polyev. He is the front runner to become the next leader of Canada's opposition, the Conservative Party. Now, he's blamed Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's spending for the inflation. In fact, he's called it just inflation, a little play on words there. And he's saying that it is uh, his half a trillion dollars of deficits that required the central bank to print money and cause inflation. And he claims that the central bank has lost its independence. He's also saying that if he were prime minister, he would empower the Auditor General to audit the Bank of Canada. Now, Poliev is said that the Auditor General must, and I quote, investigate whether the Trudeau government interfered with the Bank of Canada's independence during the pandemic by using $400 billion of nearly printed money to fund its deficits. Now, like you said, much like many other central banks, the Bank of Canada embraced quantitative easing to boost lending and spending uh, at a time with uh, geopolitical unpredictability. And I do believe that the Bank of Canada is already audited each year by two separate outside firms. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Currently, KPMG and PricewaterhouseCoopers. But taking away some of the more inflammatory comments aside, what do you think of this idea that there is more oversight needed for the Bank of Canada? Well, uh, the Bank of Canada, like the Fed, is answerable to Parliament. Uh, which I think is a pretty major oversight channel. Uh, You know, twice a year, the governor and senior deputy governor appear before a House committee and before a Senate committee. Uh, So two, two, four separate sessions most years. Um, And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll spend a couple of hours there with lots of questions and answers, all visible to the public. Um, in addition, central banks have become far more transparent on a weekly basis uh, in, uh, in my time. Uh, you know, when I was young at the Bank of Canada, there was hardly ever a governor's speech or a press conference. Now it's pretty well every month you've got something there uh, and complete transparency and willing to answer questions with the media. Um, and so, I mean, I, it's, it's hard to compare all those things, but I mean, that's a lot of transparency. Anybody can ask whatever they like. That's a lot of accountability. Uh, when accidents happen, such as you know, oil prices double in a short space of time, uh, that causes inflation. I put quotes around the word inflation temporarily. And, uh, and so you have to carefully explain how inflation is evolving, give a full accounting of inflation, so that underneath all that, you can see the parts that the central bank is responsible for or able to influence. I think everybody's done a really good job of that. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think it's a little bit of political opportunism to really uh, get into uh, those things in that way. And it's not really in keeping with, as you've described, that tradition of independence, a really important tradition, by the way. And I think more important in the future, where I think volatility and noise uh, in, in inflation and all other economic variables will be much higher. You will, you will really want to count on central bank independence in an era where uh, inflationary mistakes are more possible. What about the idea that um, the Fed and other central banks may be swayed to facilitate political agendas like those relating to climate change? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, there are dimensions in which, let's say, climate change, uh, you know, a broadening, if you like, of the set of issues that are on the table is a perfectly natural process. Uh, You know, anything that relates to the economy kind of falls under the central bank's tent. But as long as you don't translate that into explicit objectives, because the central bank really only has one tool, 
one real uh, tool and therefore really can only aim at one thing. And that that has, by consensus, become inflation. Uh, and I think that's an appropriate institutional arrangement and to separate the activities or objectives with other government agencies who have mandates of their own. Uh, that's my own sense of that, sort of a separation of church and state in a way. Right. Uh, stick to your knitting, that kind of thing. But uh, certainly in terms of financial stability, we know there's an inter intersection between climate change and financial stability or potential instability or vulnerability. And that, that angle is, of course, the province of central banks, especially if they're regulating central banks. The Bank of Canada is not a regulating central bank. It has the Office of Superintendent of Financial Institutions that does that. But even so, a collaborative relationship there. So therefore, uh, climate change does have a place. Uh, and, you know, the objectives around climate change make perfect sense. But to begin to assign them to a central bank is, I think, a step too far. Okay. Well, Stephen, one of the moves that the Bank of Canada has undertaken that's raised eyebrows, certainly on the global stage, is the move to sell its gold. Now, this was bucking the international trend, which has seen most central banks become net buyers of gold since 2010. China and Russia, for example, both added more than 1,000 tons since the early 2000s. Now, granted, the selling of Canada's gold started before you became governor of the Bank of Canada, but the mm. bank did sell the last remainder of the country's gold reserves under your supervision. And Canada now stands as the only G7 nation that does not hold at least 100 tons of gold in its official reserves. So what was the rationale for bringing Canada's gold holdings down to effectively zero? Well, as you indicated, this decision was taken long before my time. Uh, but I would just indicate clearly that it is not the Bank of Canada's decision about how much uh, gold uh, the government of Canada holds. It's the government of Canada that decides that. And the central bank is simply acting as an agent and storing uh, the gold. So that was a decision on, you know, the allocation of foreign exchange reserves is a decision made by the Minister of Finance. Uh, and the government behind behind that person, uh, not by the central bank itself. So it's not a, a conscious policy decision in the way you, you've characterized it. And so I'm not in a position to defend it or to maybe even explain all the thinking that went into that at the time. Um, but I do think that uh, Canada has lots of other foreign exchange reserves, uh, but, but I guess uh, gold is not uh, featured among them. So are you able to weigh in on whether you had been, had you been able to act independently, whether you would think that the Bank of Canada should not have sold its gold reserves? Uh, no, I don't think I'm in a position to weigh on that. I mean, it is a complicated question uh, when uh, if you have unproductive uh, assets as part of your reserves and you can substitute productive ones that are equally liquid. Uh, some would argue that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but I know that it's not a consensus around that. It's a debate that is uh, held uh, you know, with regularity, let's say, in the profession about how important is the role of gold in that, in that case. Some central banks think it's tremendously important and others uh, feel that it is much less important. And I, I know I don't have anything new to add to that debate. All right. Well, maybe you have something new to add to this debate, a theory, if you will. And that is that there has been a coordinated effort on the part of central banks and government agencies around the world to manage the price of gold, either through direct market action, such as buying or selling physical gold in large quantities, or through indirect interventions, such as directing bullion dealers and banks to place trades in order to move the price. What do you say to this notion that the, gold, the price of gold is somehow being suppressed, dare I say, manipulated or managed, and that there are higher bodies orchestrating this? I find that an extraordinary idea. I, I, uh, I have absolutely no substance that could, could go up against it uh, or for it. I've never heard a word about it. If there's a grand conspiracy, uh, I was not involved. I'm sorry. All right. 
denying that one. <laughs> Knitting sure. Star Trek and, and a strong denial on, on that one. But look, uh, Stephen, I mean, there have been a lot of gold speculators saying that we have this ideal environment for gold to rally uh, in inflation, geopolitical uncertainty, market volatility and risk. So from an economic perspective, what do you think the reasons are that gold is not performing better in this environment? Of course, you have the, the strong US dollar, but beyond that, why do you think we're not seeing gold perform as you would expect it would under all of these perfect storm scenarios? So superficially, I would say, yes, the case is uh, inflation jumped up. Gold is supposed to be an inflation hedge. Why didn't gold rally much more strongly? That's that's a, a very superficial argument. Uh, in my opinion, uh, gold, gold remains a really good but long-term inflation hedge. And just because the price of oil doubles, you will not see gold suddenly leap up to compensate gold holders for that. That, that, is, that is not what, what we mean by an inflation hedge. Uh, I think uh, what, is, what this is showing us is that inflation expectations uh, throughout the world have remained pretty well anchored. People are beginning to ask questions like, gosh, is inflation really starting to take off? And they're hearing from their central banks a careful explanation for what's going on and what they're doing about it. And I think as we have both rising interest rates as well as QT affecting those expectations, helping to buttress them. And we see, I think over the next 12 months, a steady downtrend in the headline inflation numbers. I think that's gonna reassure a lot of people. And I think in that context, I would not expect gold to be taking off uh, because the long-term inflation outlook would remain intact despite this bulge that we're all seeing. And that's the one that matters. I mean, uh, there will always be uh, movements in inflation, but as I argued before, I think most of what we're seeing is just higher prices, which is not the same as inflation at all. So you're saying that, if I may recap, that you think the price of gold hasn't really soared because of overall confidence in central banks to manage inflation? That's a nice summary. <laughs> okay, but that you as, from a personal investment perspective, do see that gold has a strong role as a long-term inflation hedge. I do, and I, and I believe, as you mentioned before, in this, in this uh, next era, there's gonna be a lot more of the kind of uncertainty that in the past has combined to give us inflation surprises. Right. So I think I think kind of like you know the 1970s setting, you know we were heavily indebted after the Second World War. We were heavily indebted because of the Vietnam War, and you know there was some nudging going on and no anchor in the monetary system. So things blew up in the early 70s uh, for those reasons. At the root of that was putting pressure on the Fed to keep rates low for longer. And inflation took off and we all imported it because we were part of the Bretton Woods system. So when you think, compare that setting to where we are today institutionally, I think people for good reason take more confidence that we will manage this. And therefore, you know, gold, gold though, uh, will remain part of everybody's portfolio, maybe a higher part, a bigger part in the future, because the environment I'm, I'm predicting is one where the interacting forces cause a lot more volatility. And so it's much harder to, to manage uh, things like inflation risk going forward. That right. just means that it's, it's an error prone environment. Okay. So, so, you know, even the best central banks can get, you know, can get a little bit misled. That'll, that can happen more likely in a volatile environment. And so I think we all should be taking out a bit more inflation protection in that longer term sense, but it's never never gonna protect us from these temporary bulges in inflation. That, that's not really what it does.